Wahnsinn. As an exchange student in Buddha, I think uh, it gave me so much opportunities to speak with the foreigners and uh, think about things from different perspective. I met a lot of people from different cultures, different countries. I think that it is a, a unique uh, uh, kind of experience uh, for me to cooperate uh, with uh, uh, other international students. So first of all, I can develop a mutual understanding because there is a huge difference between uh, Chinese and the Western thinking way. And it's really helped me uh, to uh, think very diversity. In these ways, I can find how to respect others' viewpoints and at the meantime, to let them know uh, what I'm really thinking. In my future career, I really want to work in the foreign country. That's why I think that it will help me help me in the future to get a job in the international company. Uh, I've uh, been looking for a new uh, kind of system of education here and I was really surprised by something that uh, are extremely different from the ones uh, that exist in my country. For example, in the decarbon process, China and uh, uh, Europe, they take different pathways. but. Uh, the common target for us is to have a greener and a cleaner future. At least now I know how people react on the similar things. It differs from my local, local culture. When uh, I found out that uh, I can go to Norway here while completing my master degree, I was really happy. You can make a lot of foreign uh, friends and they are have different cultural background. You can talk about a different thing and uh, experience different foods and of like uh, culture transport or culture exchange and uh, it's really meaningful. Business and governance in the Arctic rely on international cooperation in education and research. Cooperation between the eight Arctic states and between the Arctic states and global stakeholders. Cooperation through education to enhance our common knowledge about the peculiarities of this region with a shared understanding about how to approach and how to address Arctic issues to research, to build new insights and solutions to local and global challenges and opportunities in the Arctic. With a shared belief about necessary measurements and beliefs about the necessity of global partnerships in our actions. But the world is experiences crisis and chaos on several fronts that not necessarily is taking place in the Arctic, but that influence this fragile region. The corona pandemic have moved education and research online, reducing our mobility across the borders. At the expense of being present or being absent from where knowledge can be created and achieved. The climate crisis that requires that we scale up our politics, regulations, and market instruments to reduce our environmental footprint, so that our actions do not come at the expense of the Arctic climate and societies. The war in Ukraine shakes international cooperation, raising the stakes for global institutional cooperation and accelerates the debate about deglobalization. These fronts of crisis and chaos must be met reflectively with intellectual reflections, with an awareness and understanding about how the Arctic region can be affected. With some aspiration 
by Julia Donaldson, who is uh, writing children, uh, children books. A library is a symbol for our thirst for knowledge, where everyone is welcome to walk through the door. It really doesn't matter if you are rich or poor. Where we can come and meet our heroes, old and new, from William the Conqueror to Winnie the Pooh. The students are our symbol for our quest and our hopes for the future. The students in the introduction widow also brings an important voice into this panel. And they set the stage for why crisis and chaos must be met with international cooperation. They convey the wisdom of the youth, emphasizing the importance of meeting through dialogue in friendship with the courage of curiosity to learn about different beliefs and perspectives, where mutual respect and understanding must be the foundation for cooperation. So let's empower the voice of the youth in business and governance in the Arctic. So thank you for the students in the video. In this panel, we have invited distinguished guests with a common interest and vision for international cooperation in education and research in the Arctic region. I will introduce them and give each of them the floor for some minutes so they can reflect upon from their point of interest and their point of view how these fronts of crisis and chaos, being the pandemic, the climate crisis, and the war, and how these fronts challenges cooperation, business, and governance in the Arctic. We have two universities in northern Norway, and they have extensive international cooperation within both education and research, where they have a emphasis on the Arctic from various academic disciplines. Hanna Solheim Hansen, she is director at Nord University located here in Bode, while Dag Rune Olsen is rector at the Arctic University of uh, Norway that is located in Tromsø. Both of them have been leading universities through this pandemic and are now situated with this crisis and chaos that we are confronted with. I will first give the words to Hanne for them to pass it forward to Dag Rune. So please, Hanne. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for calling me to the panel. It's very interesting to be allowed to address these questions. I think, first of all, the aim of the universities is to educate both young people and elder people, but it's to educate people. And there we need to cooperate in order to be at the state of the art within all the fields that we educate in. We do research and generate new knowledge, and I think actually the crisis gives us even more opportunity and request for the new knowledge because we have to address them differently. So those are the contributions from the university in this part of the society. Uh, I think actually the pandemic learned us something very valuable and hopeful, giving us hope also, because uh, it was actually quite dramatic the day we were told to close the door for the students and close the universities. It, was, uh, it actually gave me goose pimples just thinking, how are we going to do this? But it's amazing how people knew what to do with their own responsibilities and actually managed to educate and cheat the students even though we were locked up far away from each other. So in a way it gives me a lot of hope because it shows us as human beings and as societies that we have enormous power in ourselves and know, know that we know what to do when we are really uh, hit by a crisis. So the crisis drives us forward, so in a way we learn a lot, and I think it is, uh, there are some benefits from the crisis we have met and the crisis that the war uh, also put upon us. I think we have to be uh, more brave, and it's important that we don't allow the war to overshadow uh, the big issue 
that we have to uh, address the climate change. So it's important that we uh, allow ourselves to think the long thoughts, even though we have a crisis really close to us. So we have to be brave, braver. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Hamann. Dag Runa, please. Thank you. And it's a pleasure for me to, to be with you here today and to, to address you on some very important topics, issues. The moderator just touched upon the challenges we have had or are in the midst of. We are talking about the climate crisis, the need for a green shift has already been, already been addressed, uh, the pandemic, and also now the war. These are three challenges, three happenings, which is a global phenomena, or are global phenomena. And I think they only can be dealt in that way also. And that also challenged us as universities, because I do think that it calls for more tighter international collaboration than the opposite. When it comes to the uh, climate change, and since this is a high north dialogue, we do know that the consequences of the climate shift is something we face uh, to a most dramatic uh, degree in the high north. That means that it's also a laboratory for how the global or the, the climate change will impact our globe. Researching into this on a, a global scale, I think, provides us with detailed knowledge of how this should be tackled. But we can't do this alone. We can't do this without collaboration. And yes, there is a war going on. Yes, there are challenging times. But I, still, I think we need to do our utmost to continue the collaboration over one of the most pressing issues on this globe uh, in, these, uh, in these times. Of course, we do need to understand the climate change. That calls for education and research in that very topic. But also, we need to step up to see how can we actually contribute by education, by or through uh, research and innovation, through a sustainable and a just transition, the green shift. Coming up with new solutions that is just for society, that is just for, for people. It's not only a technological issue, it is a societal issue that we need to under, understand to address. The uh, pandemic showed us that investing into research over decades and collaborate across borders between nations and scientist groups is the only way we can actually tackle a pandemic. It's only through this collaboration we can develop new vaccines, immunization of the, the people. Of course, you can close borders, but you can't do that forever. You have to come up with other solutions than the politicians have at their hand, and that's why it's so, the research is so important. And when it comes to, to, to uh, the war. Of course, that is something that is extremely hampering for also research in the high north, in the Arctic. Yes, we um, do know that Russia is the, one of the biggest Arctic states, and we can't collaborate with Russian scientists these days. That is worrisome, of course. The war is much more worrisome, but we have to take it, uh, think ahead and see how are we going to restructure, reshape, so we can regain momentum when it comes to climate, for example, research in the high north. I strongly believe that we have learned a lot from the pandemic, uh, and that is how the way we interact with each other. Of course, as uh, my colleague here mentioned, overnight we turned education into a digital format. Perhaps not the, not the perfect digital format. Teams is not a ped pedagogical tool. It is a, a way of conveying um, dialogues and discussions. But we learned a lot about how we can use the, these tools as uh, in an educational setting, and perhaps we can develop new tools and learn how to use them more pedagogically, so we can distribute education to a much larger extent. But we can also use the same tools to collaborate across borders between researchers. So, yes, the pandemic separated us, but the technology can join us. I'm, I'm for sure, I think that some of the uh, things we learned is of, um, of high value also when we're going to tackle the new challenges ahead, because we have to address those in our education and and also in our research. Thank you. Thank you, Dagruna. 
One question before I move towards the other panelists. Uh, Gri also, uh, she raised some concerns about the confusion about what is right knowledge. So what is the right knowledge? And about de-evaluating knowledge. Uh, and you talk about technology that can bring sort of knowledge together. But we also see that when we have a lot of uh, technological platforms that we can use, it can be quite confusing. What is actually what? What type of knowledge should we actually trust? Mm. So, what do you think about sort of the confusion about the knowledge? Well, it's absolutely a true thing that is, uh, you are mentioning here. Uh, I think uh, confronting each other and really having the debate is uh, going to help us uh, find out. Uh, the most truth, and then it is definitely so that the truth could be a truth somewhere and not a truth in another place. So, uh, but uh, discussing it is a good, uh, good way of, uh, f uh, would you say, getting out the best and the most important part mm. of it. Mm. But we need to discuss it. Mm. I think it's um, Jürgen Halmas that has talked about the, the power of the best argument, or the better argument. So, in a scientific setting, we harness our arguments to see what is really truth. Of course, that can be discussed as a phenomenon. But what we can do as uh, researchers, as scholars, as scientists, is to apply our methodology. Because we have a rigorous methodology that pr can bring new insight, new real knowledge to the table. And there's so many challenges out there today where you can discuss and debate and, and not all of, it, all of it is uh, necessarily valuable to listen to. So I think one of the, the um, responsibilities of scholars today is to demantle, to, to um, uh, with arguments, penetrate what is really uh, valuable knowledge and what is not. And then it's based on our um, methodology as scholars. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we should be and can be quite frank when we enter the, the public debate and say, this is not evidence-based. This is probably a much better conclusion to what you are discussing and things like that. And that is what I think is or should be our contribution into a public debate. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dagrina. Uh, Elise Nyborg. Uh, she is a recent postgraduate at the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of uh, Cambridge. And uh, she is a research assistant at the Arctic Institute, uh, with, and she also has exclusive membership in many organizations, <laughs> and among others, the Arctic Youth Network and the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. Uh, you hold uh, deep research experience on the impact of climate change on the Russian forests and the interactions between Arctic regime shifts in socio-ecological systems. Nyborg, can you tell us a bit how you see that these fronts of crisis and chaos is challenging the Arctic area? Uh, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to speak on this panel. So my family comes from northern Norway, but I've lived most of my life outside Norway, which you can probably hear by my very Americanized accent. <laughs> uh, I consider the multicultural exposure and exchange afforded by those experiences as a, one of the key parts of my education. And in fact, it's the combination of like this local routing with a more global orientation that encouraged me to get involved in the Arctic in the first place. Uh, and I feel my personal experience in education is in some small way reflective of the effects of the current shifts that we're talking about today in research and education. So my personal involvement in international research collaboration has primarily been with Russia uh, because of the very um, place-specific and interdisciplinary nature of my master's research. From a purely practical standpoint, I could not have done my research without bilateral access to Russian data and I couldn't have done it properly without pursuing active forms of collaboration. And I think this shift towards plurality in both perspectives and access to science is something that is happening across many disciplines uh, across the world, but is particularly important to the Arctic because of the um, environmental, socio-political, and uh, economic challenges that doing research here poses. Um, <laughs> Um, in my case, uh, international research cooperation was also necessary for mitigating the challenges I experienced during the pandemic. It was a big blow for me to not be able to go to Russia myself and pursue uh, fieldwork and study. 
as so many of my student colleagues before me had done. But uh, having to rely on digital and uh, remote access alone did encourage me to kind of uh, engage more creatively with my research topic and come up, I think, with maybe more novel solutions. Uh, but just kind of remotely accessing this data was definitely not enough for me. I needed the, the help of those who had produced it or acquired it in this position, Russians, to help me navigate it and explain um, its limitations, its context. So I think it is important for us to distinguish between different levels of international cooperation in research and education and that their outcomes are not equal in education. So, you know, passive cooperation in data access is not the same as active collaboration in knowledge production. You know, an institutional subscription to a, a journal or data repository in a different country is not the same as actually going there to do a, an exchange. So, uh, and even the former is at risk now. You know, it goes without saying that I could not have done my dissertation now, even in its already impacted form. My experience and concerns really don't matter in the grand scheme of things as one person, <laughs> but they're also not unique to me at all, um, as demonstrated for, by the video that we just watched and I'm sure shared by many of you here today. So scaled up then, what are the consequences within research and education, but also beyond? Uh, I don't think it's getting enough impact that these shifts we're talking about are unequally distributed among um, kind of early career and more experienced researchers. And in some ways, I think the more uh, senior generation is more protected from the fallout of these shifts because they, to some extent, can like, fall back on a safety net of experience, networks, and, and like, kind of wait these turbulence times out. But what about those of us who can't, you know, who are just starting our careers? And you know, how do we create our own connections when the opportunities to do so are limited? Do we just stop? Like, do we start over? Uh, I don't think that we can afford to wait. And also, what about the young people um, who would be interested in studying this region, but are now kind of driven away from doing so? You know, whether that's down to the field being considered perhaps less productive in terms of you know, limited data creation, engagement, but also maybe just because it's not as exciting anymore when you cannot travel so much. Uh, you know, those things are limited. I think that's important. And will young researchers' willingness to invest time and effort into future collaborations uh, be limited or restricted now that this kind of decoupling is occurring so quickly. And uh, yeah, I also think that young people might even be afraid to get involved in this area at all just because of how politically fraught and tense doing so is. So we talk so much about widening access across marginalized and underrepresented groups, you know, in, across indigeneity, gender, sexuality, nationality, location, and I do fear that this might be undermined. And ultimately, I think, you know, what does this mean for the production of knowledge itself? You know, just to kind of maintain the very existence of these research communities, we cannot afford to have young people pushed out of them. You know, so how do we protect them? The thousands of young people in the Ukraine who are dispossessed of their education and displaced, the Russian um, people studying who are cut off from their homes and maybe facing abuse or vitriol in their places of education, uh, just uh, everybody affected by this horrible situation and the barriers it has so th suddenly thrown up. But, um, you know, otherwise what talent, innovation and ideas are we risking leaving behind? Uh, because I think also maintaining current levels of cooperation is not enough. You know, how do we move beyond protecting to possibility? In these post-normal times, uh, we need like interactions both between and within geographies, pedagogies, ontologies, geographies, more than ever. You know, how else will we shine a light on new solutions and also build stronger pathways to achieving them? And ultimately, I do fear that a loss of opportunity for young people will translate to a loss of understanding. And kind of as the Arctic's future decision makers, as we hear so often, what does that mean then for our understanding in the new future, but also our resilience in coping with the challenging times that lie ahead? Thank you, Lisa. That's very valuable reflections. <laughs> and you address something so important, that the experienced researchers, they have already established uh, international cooperation. And uh, you dwell on the challenges for the youth re researcher to get, sort of get access to the researchers across borders. How can we sort of facilitate for the youth to still sort of have access to an international landscape? Well, that is the perfect question to ask to all of these representatives of institutions here. Yeah, I'd love to hear what they have to say. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think? 
I mean, beyond official channels, I obviously cannot comment on the official um, kind of mechanisms in place to protect and create, but I do think um, engaging in these like youth organization platforms does offer a, a venue for collaboration outside the official, which can be almost more productive in some ways because it's uninhibited perhaps by the restrictions posed in an official setting. And uh, I do think it's like almost like a form of citizen diplomacy, you know, creating these networks about across borders um, with youth and, you know, coming together in pursuit of a common goal. I think it's a very powerful thing. Hmm. So you are a part of a lot of these youth networks focusing on the Arctic region. Do you experience that you have the same dialogue with the same topics in the sort of youth forum compared to when you meet uh, researchers with ha which have sort of stayed in the game for many years? Are there various concerns? Well, obviously, the youth perspective is much more youth-oriented. That uh, goes without, without saying. I, I, maybe you could reframe the, the question, perhaps. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking that we have sort of been in the game so long. Are mm. we able to see sort of the new uh, challenges or the new opportunities that we need to grab in the Arctic? So do you, do you have, like, different debates? Mm. I do think that perhaps in the academy things are so segregated mm. just by, you know, it has to be almost by sense, you know, you have different courses that you study, uh, different departments for different things that often don't overlap and intermingle, but when a lot of young people come together in one space, those like disciplinary silos are like knocked over, <laughs> you know, there's a much more intermingling of uh, ideas, disciplines, perspectives that I think usually don't come together or are considered too challenging to do in an official setting. And that is what we need, right? To address so. issues in the Arctic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dag well, I appreciate what you say, and I don't think that we, uh, heads of institution or people that are at our age, is necessarily capable of <laughs> understanding and seeing the need for these uh, uh, platforms across disciplines. Uh, and I, I, I'm so happy to hear that you challenge us, because that is what's important for us. Yes, we are decision makers, and that's how it, uh, how it is and must be. But we are not uh, perhaps in the best place uh, to really understand the needs of, of the youth. And I'm so fascinating to, to hear how uh, younger people at universities, they are challenging us with respect to uh, cross-disciplinary approaches, uh, more holistic uh, ways of thinking, but also uh, be more innovative, and they're not really so afraid and protective. So challenge us every day, please, and thank you. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it, it's interesting that when uh, the government, when they produce white papers, they have now started to use a youth panel. And there's a reason for that, mm. because they just see different things than we do. For example, when they made the white paper about the North, uh, one of the obvious things that was mentioned here earlier, Nicole, that how to find a job. And we have a lot of jobs. So it's they see something, they're in a different life situation, and they look for other things. So. Definitely, and they, they're not afraid. They're not afraid, so let's use them. Let's use the youth. Uh, we have one panelist uh, together with us uh, digitally, Sang Shin. Uh, he is the deputy director at the School of Politics and International Relations at East China Normal University in Shanghai. Zin holds a PhD in political science from UCLA and holds academic expertise in comparative political economy, political sociology, and Russian and Eurasian politics. He is actively engaged in the international research community, publishing in well-known journals and writing policy reports for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China and China Development Bank. He is also the executive council member of the Chinese Association of Russian, Eastern Europe and Central Asia Studies. Sin, I hope you can hear us and that the sound is uh, good for you. I would like to give the word to you. All right, um, I hope the connection is uh, good. Um, thank you for having me. Um, given the topics I was given, uh, in advance, I would say uh, among the three big challenges uh, the organizer uh, provided 
in China, at least from my uh, perspective, the, the, the sequence of the priority is as follows. Uh, the pandemic, pandemic control is the uh, number one policy task followed by not, not, not uh, uh, necessarily the war in Ukraine, but uh, uh, geopolitical shifts in general, and then followed by uh, climate change. So I guess the, the priority we see um, within China among these major three challenges are probably uh, different from uh, uh, other countries. And then how... Um, do we um, adjust and adapt to these uh, big challenges within China? Again, speaking from my uh, position as a uh, university-based scholar and uh, an administrator um, of some university research uh, center. For the past two years, obviously, um, all universities in China are trying their best to adapt to these uh, big challenges, particularly the uh, pandemic-induced uh, challenge, um, uh, huge infrastructure updating, uh, upgrading in order to handle more uh, online uh, instruction. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm speaking from uh, Shanghai, uh, my home city, uh, which is under de facto lockdown, of a city of uh, 25 million people. And I think that's the best, the best example of uh, when we speak of challenge. Right? So, um, and the universities in, in China are also uh, adjusting its international uh, collaboration uh, in the context of pandemic and the shifting geopolitical uh, environment. Uh, for example, um, in terms of our traditional international uh, education programs, uh, where in, uh, in the past two years we now actually uh, shift to uh, recruit most, more international students who are in China right now, because um, as uh, most of you probably are aware of, uh, China still has a very strict um, uh, policy of uh, uh, border control, uh, of uh, pandemic control. So most of our international students outside of China uh, couldn't come to China for face-to-face uh, -face instruction. So in the past two years, many of the uh, traditional uh, international education program within China, within Chinese uh, in, uh, higher education institutions, now uh, actually pay more attention to those international students who are already in China. Right? When we recruit, make our recruitment decisions. Yeah? And uh, another uh, related uh, scene, uh, before, the, before a lot of European countries uh, had to think about their collaboration with Russia right now, um, China's had a slightly less dramatic uh, um, geopolitical um, confrontation with the uh, with, uh, US um, probably from 2017 to 2018. It actually had, had some impact on higher education too. And that, that uh, was also exacerbated by um, uh, the recent pandemic, right? So a lot of students have to think about where going, they're going to uh, take their overseas education. U.S. used to be, uh, without any doubt, the most attractive uh, destination for uh, international higher education. But things have been uh, dramatically changing uh, in the past three or four years. Um, and then uh, a higher education institution within China is also trying to adapt to that um, to give students some uh, devices how to, where to look for opportunities for in, uh, education and possible research collaboration beyond the US. Right? Um, that's another trend that we're trying to adapt to um, uh, for, the, for the future. And then uh, on the larger scale, um, both as a result of the pandemic and the, the uh, uh, deteriorating, deteriorating um, uh, geopolitical uh, changes, uh, the, uh, the Chinese state also is reconsidering its overall um, foreign policy direction, including its major economic um, foreign policy uh, directions, uh, exemplified mostly in the so-called Belt and Road Initiative uh, there has been a very heated debate and discussion on whether uh, the, ch the Chinese states and uh, the big co companies need to um, adjust the, the specific policy measures within the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, again, given the pandemic and uh, the, the quickly shifting um, uh, geopolitical context. And that has 
going to have an impact on international education and international uh, collaboration in research too. Right? Um, so far, um, the Chinese, uh, Chinese government, especially the China Scholarship uh, Council, have still trying to maintain its uh, profile, its portfolio and profile of funding uh, international students uh, overseas education and the international education and the research collaboration. But uh, there might be a shift in, 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 the, in the near future in terms of where these funding opportunities are going to um, uh, focus on in terms of geographic um, uh, coverage of these state-funded pro uh, projects. Uh, projects. Uh, um, there might be a, a further emphasis on those countries or regions that are directly tied with uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and that's going to be directly related to a lot of uh, European countries, Eurasian countries, countries in the Europe-Asia continent and Africa. So this is another a big trend where we're, we're trying to, trying to uh, uh, take the opportunity uh, to adapt to. Um, but overall, I think uh, uh, the three big challenges the climate change has, uh, from my perspective, has the least uh, direct impact on what we do within China in higher education, in international uh, collaboration so far. Uh, but uh, it, this, in this point, in, in, in this particular dimension, I think uh, keeping international collaboration like those programs that we are, uh, we feel very fortunate to have the opportunity to work with uh, uh, our uh, Norwegian partners like Northern University become particularly uh, important and precious. Right? And uh, a lot of uh, the students we uh, managed to send to North uh, for the past two years, uh, when they came back to, to China, men, men, quite a few of them um, really gained a, 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 a unprecedented awareness of uh, climate issues, um, key policy issues related to the high noise to the Arctic, and then uh, really push themselves to, to think about uh, the climate change not only as a very distant uh, policy challenge, but a, a, a issue, a challenge that's very close to them, close to them as Chinese, close to uh, China. Right? So I think that's the value on, um, of keeping up our international collaboration. I hope we'll still have opportunity to, to keep that kind of projects going, uh, despite, again, the previous two challenges, the pa pandemic and the geopolitical shifts. Right? Um, to close my short comments, let, uh, to please allow me to uh, quote from a recent policy piece I co-authored with uh, some uh, European uh, colleagues before the EU-China uh, summit uh, last Friday. Um, so the, the concluding um, uh, paragraph in our policy, short policy piece reads like the following. A change of mindset is crucial pre prerequisite here, uh, getting out of the pandemic-induced isolation and avoiding the mental logic of internal circulation and black-white thinking. Instead, robust and more diverse communication channels between the EU and China are needed for the current and future crisis communication. And I think that's also the mes message I would like to convey to the to today's uh, podium and to today's audience when we think about uh, future uh, international education and research collaboration between China and our Norwegian or European uh, colleagues. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Sin. Uh, so when you uh, talk about um, the priority of attention on the various challenges that the world are facing today, I interpreted that the priority is about uh, handling uh, the situation today. So what, how do you prioritize the challenges today? But if you take your glasses on and look a bit uh, forward into the future, how do you think that the geopolitical shift and the pandemic will affect the mobility of researchers and students uh, in and out of China? Um, that's something actually we've been uh, examining and try to have some sort of guidance for our own work in the, in the near future. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'm a little bit pessimistic on the pandemic control part. It seems um, um, the, the world has not come to a, to a stage where we can say the pandemic uh, is really coming to a, a somewhat uh, manageable, manageable level. And particularly from uh, China's perspective, the uh, viral 
zero uh, COVID policy will be uh, in place still for the next few months at least. And uh, um, it seems that the, the, the Chinese state and the, um, and the related government institutions are still very much uh, uh, hoping to achieve this zero uh, COVID policy at, uh, regardless of uh, what kind of uh, other uh, social and economic costs that kind of policy may take? Right? So, as a and then uh, I think the recent geopolitical shift we see in the U European theater um, is is really dragging China uh, into uh, um, this uh, this uh, European uh, predominantly European uh, conflict. Um, whether whether the Chinese uh, counterparts is willingly. Uh, to be drawn in or not. Right? So I see a deteriorating uh, geopolitical um, context overall in the uh, foreseeable future. Um, so on, on, uh, as a consequence, as a consequence, um, it will be still will be difficult to see sort of a, uh, going back to the good old days of a relatively easy, smooth cross-border mobility of students, uh, researchers, uh, between China and, uh, for example, you Norway or Europe, and uh, uh, and then relatedly, uh, we might expect to see some shift, not necessarily 180 degree of uh, change, but some adjustment of uh, the direction of such mobility. Right, um, as I briefly mentioned, maybe less less the students will go to US as their first top choice and questionable top choice of uh, higher education more well be uh, willing to uh, think about Europe, uh, uh, other parts of Asia, um, uh, and also in terms of international education or research collaboration, that kind of uh, shift, uh, uh, spatial shift of uh, international education collaboration uh, is very likely to, uh, to, uh, to continue to happen. Uh, I think there, there, personally, I think there's more, more opportunity actually between China and Europe on that regard. Uh, again, given the overall still very limited mobility across mobility I see in the near future, but there, there's very likely a, a push to shift yeah. uh, of that kind of uh, uh, collaboration to, to Europe uh, from, uh, uh, from China. I think that uh, must that, be our hope, uh, Sin. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and then we have Harald Nybøle. Uh, he is the director of the Division Internationalization and Quality in Higher Education at the Norwegian Directorate for Higher Education and Skills. And he is a political scientist with extensive international experience working amongst others at the EFTA secretary in Brussels, the OECD in Paris and at the Nordic Council of Ministries. What is your reflections about the cooperation in, in the Arctic during the challenges that we are now facing? Well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Hanne and uh, Norden University for, for inviting me to, to speak at this, uh, at this gathering. Um, and it has been really uh, fascinating also to hear the other debates that we had earlier uh, today. I was in Tromsø last week uh, I'm in Bodø this week, and I'm wondering where I'll be next week. But uh, it just shows how important uh, the North is and the Arctic is. Um, so I come from a government agency uh, here in Norway uh, that is called the Directorate for Higher Education and Skills. And uh, one of the most important tasks that, uh, that we have in our agency is to create and build programs and projects that would enhance international cooperation in education. Uh, and uh, mobility then, both for students, uh, staff and faculty. Uh, we have um, a couple of specific programs. We have the INTPART program, uh, we have the UTFORSK uh, program, that are specifically uh, meant for cooperation uh, between countries, but then outside of Europe. Uh, and then promoting uh, mobility uh, between, between these countries. Uh, in addition to that, 
uh, we are also the national agency uh, for the Erasmus Plus program, so the European Union's uh, and the world's biggest uh, um, education program. Um, I think that it's been really interesting to see, and I'm so glad to see so many international students here today. Uh, and that is, uh, that's, that's a trademark of uh, Newell University, but also uh, of the Arctic uh, uh, University of, of Norway, uh, to have many international students. Uh, and let's hope that that will continue. Uh, I think that um, the government presented uh, a couple of years ago a white paper. Uh, and in this white paper on international student mobility, uh, they mentioned a specific goal of having 50% of Norwegian students actually taking part of uh, their education abroad. This is a, a very ambitious goal. Uh, but I think it is a very important goal. Uh, and I think that uh, before the pandemic, we were at around 16%. So we have a long ways to go, and of course, then there was a big dip in, nine, uh, in 2020 and 2021. But I think what is really exciting from my perspective, and I think we should all be really happy for this, and that is to see that we now see a great surge and a great interest uh, in uh, especially uh, student mobility once again, and we are back at the same levels that we were uh, before the pandemic. So that's really good news. Uh, another thing uh, which shows the, the Norwegian government's uh, importance of uh, international um, exchange and international cooperation in education is that uh, they want that uh, every student who starts in whatever subject area, the uh, exchange possibility should be an integral part of the studies. So, and it should also be not a sort of an opt-in situation. No, it should be an opt-out situation. So if you absolutely, for some reason, uh, do not want and you or you cannot take a semester abroad, for example, then, of course, you are allowed to do that. But that would be an active out opt-out situation, and I think that is also, that's really the way to go, at least if we are to ever come to those 50% uh, of Norwegian students going uh, abroad for part of their studies. <clears throat> and then, why is this so important? Why are we talking about, uh, you know, international cooperation in education, and why are we talking about um, why is it so important for students to spend part of their studies abroad? Sometimes I, um, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, part of my background, uh, and uh, you know, in settings like this, I often say that uh, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, a student mobility or uh, be abroad as long as I have. Um, I, I left Norway when I was. 17, and uh, I was gone for 19 years before I came back. Um, that's maybe overdoing it a little <laughs> bit, but I, th I still think uh, that it is really, really important uh, for everyone to have this uh, possibility of actually studying uh, abroad. And it is because we have seen that when you take part of your studies abroad, you learn so many different things. Of course, you learn the subject area that you're studying, and you maybe get that from different perspectives than you would get uh, where you originally came from. But there are so many other skills that you also develop that I think are more important now than ever before. We learn more tolerance, we learn intercultural skills, we learn problem solving, and accepting different ways of doing things. So these are all skills that are really important for the individual and for the individual person growing during his or her studies. But we also have to remember that on a more global scale and a more societal scale, these skills 
are just as important. Because we need, we really need to promote our liberal and democratic values. And I think that we also believe that another aspect of, uh, of this international education is that it actually helps improve the quality of education overall. We learn from each other, we get different perspectives, we get faculty onto our campuses, we get our international students onto our campuses, and they are and I hope, you know, this is to all of you international students out there, and also to all the Norwegian students who actually should be thinking about taking a semester abroad. Thank you, first of all, for being here. Uh, and uh, you are such an asset to the uh, student environment and to the intellectual community that a university has to offer. The last thing I, I wanted to also uh, touch upon uh, is the, the whole... Um, issue of sustainability. Of course, this is really important. That is really, really important, and several of, of the other speakers talked about this uh, today. It is really important for the young people, and this is something that we also have to uh, take seriously. Uh, and I think that this is also important from a, when we look at the, um, the SG, SDGs. Uh, we know that the, the SDG on uh, quality education is really important, but so many of the other SDGs are also really important to all of us. And then we have to see, what does this mean then? How can this impact what we do as far as, um, doesn't this come in conflict with uh, international education and international student mobility? And in a way, in a way uh, maybe it does. But I think that what we will be seeing, uh, because you, know, you asked, well, what will the future bring and what, what will this look like? And I think that what we will be seeing is that we will see that there is a need and there is a want of actually meeting again physically uh, across borders. And we will see a big surge uh, in uh, student mobility and also staff and faculty mobility in the time to come when things get a little bit back uh, back to normal. Um, and, um, but I think that we will see shorter mobilities. We will see more mobility from a European perspective. We will see more mobility within Europe. Um, someone said the other day, we will actually have uh, more Bayern than Brisbane. And that's, uh, that's probably a correct uh, observation. But I think at the same time, I think that it is important that we should not forget and we should not discourage also the, the longer distances and uh, the longer mobilities. Because that is also really valuable. Uh, but there we have to make sure that, you know, if you go from here to China, then you stay in China for a while. You don't go back and forth all the time. So that's also different aspects that we, you know, so these things are things that we are, are, are looking at. Harald, you also have it termed internationalization at home. What, mm. do you, what do you mean with that? Does it mean that we can stay here in Buda and learn about the world? That's a good question. And I think I, I, I mentioned it a little bit. Because even if we have at one point 50% mobility of students. And, you know, I would say, why not go to 100%? But, but that's, not, <laughs> that's not government policy, so I didn't say that. Um, but I think that means that there are a lot of students who are not actually able to, um, to go abroad. And that is why, as I said, it is so important to have international students on campus here in Norway, and we have to work even harder to see how these international students can be used as a resource, uh, so that they are not just left alone, okay, okay, those are the international students, they are over there, and they, they take those classes, but we have to really make an effort to see how these can be used as a resource, as an asset, because in that way, 
That is internationalization mm. at home. And the same thing with international faculty then. We need international faculty to come to uh, our campuses and give them uh, these perspectives. So you have brought a new uh, motivation for our rectors in the panel. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. uh, Lawrence Smith. Uh, he is a professor in environmental studies at Brown University at the Institute for Environment and Society at the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences. Smith has extensive research expertise in the Arctic and in water resources. And he has published in well-known journals such as the Science and Nature. He also has an important and influential voice when it comes to concerns about the Arctic environment. So, Lawrence, what is your perspective on how this crisis and chaos that we are facing will sort of challenge the Arctic region? Yes, thank you. Um, these three global forces of climate change, the pandemic, and war present both many challenges and opportunities for cooperation and governance in the Arctic. Um, for starters, let us not forget that the observation of climate, of accelerated climate change in the Arctic has galvanized a global response against climate change. All right, this has been brought about through decades of careful generation of factual knowledge, scientific knowledge within the region involving international collaborations among the Arctic countries. In fact, in the early years, 25 years ago, some of the most compelling evidence of climate change came from Russia, because Russian scientists of all the Arctic nations have the longest history of careful documentation of meteorology and drifting ice stations and, and so on. So we got a good 10 to 15 year head start on our understanding of this problem, thanks to collaborations with Russian scientists working together with, with Western scientists. The, um, This cooperation has been galvanized. And it, in fact, I would go so far as to argue there might not be a Paris Accord if not for the, accelerated observa the observations of accelerated climate change in the Arctic, which is happening at two to three times the global mean average. The pandemic has obviously posed many challenges to this um, in science, in education. Uh, I myself have three remote hydrometeorological instrument stations in northern Greenland. I have not been able to visit them to do my field work for two years. Um, the, yet, the digitalization associated with this pandemic has created new solutions and opportunities. Uh, I've been able, for example, work with Greenlanders remotely over Zoom to train them to do the equipment servicing that I needed for these stations, and they were able to perform maintenance on them remotely. Uh, the normalization of online education uh, has seen a 15 to 20 year acceleration. I mean, professors are now accustomed to running you know, online classes, accustomed to handling um, hybrid classes. And this is to the great benefit of Arctic communities and uh, consor university consortia, such as the University of the Arctic, which served northern students through access to educators in, in more southern areas. And you know, it's, it's easy to forget here in Norway how special this area is and how much access there is to education in, in Norway, Sweden. And the Kola Peninsula in general is a very special place with a lot of infrastructure. That simply doesn't exist for the vast majority of the circumpolar north. And uh, this quick acceleration towards online education. While I agree we should all go abroad and experience the Arctic for ourselves, it's simply not possible. And through this normalization of online education, I think we will actually uh, see enhanced appreciation and understanding of this little understood area. Take only this conference, for example. I've been coming to this for years. We've never had a thousand participants before, but we have a thousand last year and this from dozens of countries. So this is, this is really great. Um, the war. And not just this war, but the deglobalization de that I fear may follow this war. This is, a, this is a tremendous challenge, obviously, for 
international scientific cooperation and education, as I just mentioned. You know, the heart blood of this conference is the recruitment and the joining of international students from all over, you know, including Russia, a very important and special constituency here uh, at Nord University. Um, I'm, I'm worried about that moving forward. I hope to see it continue. I'm dismayed to learn that the China uh, Scholarship Council may be revisiting their, um, how they allocate their resources. And I've had the privilege and honor of hosting several students from China funded by the US CSC who come to work with me and learn about the Arctic and go home. And this is, this is, this is wonderful for the world. So that is certainly uh, a, a challenge. And in particular, in the context of this war, um, I worry about the, the frailty of the Arctic cooperation that we have all worked so hard to grow over the last 25 years. And it has been just wonderful to see this growth in cooperation at the scientific, educational, and political level. And um, it, uh, it can easily be swept aside by greater forces um, at foot in the world. So I think we need to work especially hard to protect that, particularly in the context of Russia, because there is no true Arctic cooperation without Russia. It is the biggest Arctic nation with a long and proud history of working in this area. And over the long term, we have to find ways to successfully re-engage with our, with our Russian partners and international partners. Uh, I am hopeful um, for that in the long term. We can discuss that you know, more. Um, maybe not at the highest official channels, but there are many you know, um, lower level, person to person, researcher to researcher, track two, track three connections that are still being maintained at this difficult time, and, and hopefully they can prevail moving forward. Thank you. Lorenz. So you mentioned the pandemic, the deglobalization, that international cooperation can be sort of affected. Are we in the danger that our scientific insight about the Arctic can sort of melt down? I, there's certainly a danger. I mean, our knowledge, like, so if we stop the science, how do we actually know what's going on in the Arctic? Well, this is a real threat, and both the um, political breakdown, it's now very difficult for Russian scientists to travel abroad to participate in conferences, including this one, for example. This is, this is you know, that is a loss for all. Uh, there is also concern about the dissemination of fake knowledge, as was raised earlier in a, in a previous panel. This is the, the global information diaspora has, has changed, and um, it's something we need to be vigilant about. So I, I do not think we can take for granted uh, all the benefits and um, customs we've gotten used to over the th uh, last 25 years moving forward. We need to stay vigilant um, on all fronts. Mm, thank you, Lawrence. I think we will stop with your words. Thank you, Lawrence. Mm. And thank you to all the panelists for participating today with your reflections. It was very valuable to us, so thank you. <laughs>